advert break there. Right, uh, thank you so much for joining us for this discussion um, on flying. Is it the biggest elephant in the room? Now, if anyone is milling around around the outsides, please do come and join us for this discussion. I promise you it's going to be a super interesting one. We have some really, really fabulous panelists on stage. Okay, let's kind of set the scene. Who here feels a little bit guilty when they fly? Hmm. I think we have got to that stage where we do all feel a little bit guilty. I think by virtue of the fact that you're here, you'll probably presumably care about the environment and are aware that flying currently isn't the cleanest thing to do. However, it is also extremely necessary. It's important that we experience different cultures. It's important that we work in different countries. It's important for globalization. We need it. And yet, it is slightly lagging in the electrification space behind its vehicle counterparts. So where are, are we? Where do we go? And what are some of the solutions? Well, here to shed all the light on all of those big meaty questions are, of course, our wonderful panelists. I'm going to ask them to kick us off by briefly introducing themselves. And we'll start furthest away and make our way this way. Uh, hi, Michael Bernard. Uh, unlike the rest of the people, I don't actually do anything. They, they actually do stuff. Uh, I analyze, I project, I do scenarios through 2100 of major carbon problems, including aviation, the reason I'm here. So I have a projection of aviation demand and aviation repowering through 2100 decade by decade, and I engage with investors. I sit on the advisory board of an electric aviation firm in the UK, that kind of stuff. So these people will talk about what's happening today, and I'll, tell them, I'll talk about why it's not a problem. <laughs> Man of mystery. We will explore more and more in just a moment. But before we do, Mike. Hi, my name is Mike Andrews. I'm a professional pilot, a flight instructor, and I'm the spokesperson for Sealand Flight with our uh, electric aviation program, or electric uh, flight training. I've been lucky enough to go in one of these before, and I cannot wait for you to explain a little bit more, because they are pretty extraordinary. Kim. Uh, I'm Kim Gerglis. I'm the sector lead for transportation with uh, BC Hydro, and I work on uh, decarbonizing transportation, including aviation. Erica. My name is Erica Holtz. I am the program manager and lead engineer for Harbor Air, uh, their electrification program. And if Erica looks a little bit familiar to you, that's because she has been featured on an episode of the Fully Charged Show, um, I think two or three years ago now. Three years. Mm. Time. Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> Sandy. Yeah, my name is Sandy Monroe. I uh, um, have a company called Monroe and Associates, and we tear apart or help design pretty much anything that's electric. Currently, we're working on two VTOLs, vertical takeoff machines, and I uh, have toured almost every electric uh, kind of aircraft, including the battery pack. So. I've had a chance to see quite a bit. I, I mean, we only have 26 minutes, 32 seconds, and there are so many different aspects that we could get into. So I'll do my best to hopefully give you some useful bits of information. Okay, Michael, let's start with you. You said that you're, you have that big picture view. You can see that pathway to net zero aviation. Give us kind of the five or the, or the three to five key big steps that we need to go through between now and that net zero moment? Uh, sure, let's start with uh, electric aviation is gonna start with planes exactly like the Pipistrel back here. Fixed wing, smaller, they're gonna grow fairly rapidly. Uh, current battery energy density is suitable for 30 to 60 passengers in a hybrid battery electric turboprop for 600 kilometers. Divert and reserve is managed by the uh, biofuels but we see a 95% emissions reduction. Uh, right now, CATL introduced a battery with double the lithium ion battery energy density. Silicon anode uh, solutions have been uh, fixed now, the problems of expansion there. So we're seeing potentially five times at theoretical maximum of what CATL is providing. This gives us all incontinent aviation for passengers viable with battery electric, except for here to Miami. Like here to Miami, you're not gonna do. You're not gonna go across the ocean. And so what we're seeing is already, we're seeing 
millions of tons of sustainable aviation fuels bunkered for aviation. It's what everybody's doing. Batteries are going to grow up from the bottom, eat out the bottom end of the jet market. It's going to be actually quite reasonable to do, but it's going to take a long time. It's going to take decades, not years. Okay. A few things that you, you mentioned there, and we will hopefully return to them. Now, Sandy, I feel like I should have probably been in the previous session because I imagine you addressed some of those these questions there. But one of the things that we see with electric aviation is this question of energy density and ensuring that there's enough energy within a given space, volume, weight, etc., to make this viable. Where are we on that energy density question and where do we need to get for aircraft to really be viable as a battery electric option? So when we start looking at long range, like the getting to Miami or something like that, you have to start thinking uh, in an entirely different way. We're not going to be able to make a battery, uh, first off, that's big enough to contain that, not for uh, decades, maybe, maybe 10 of them, maybe a century. I don't know, but at this juncture, uh, I only know of one battery that's good enough for aircraft, and that's Ampres, and that's who, um, that's who Airbus is fooling around with. To get long range, um, you have to do something different. You have to have something called a fuel cell. A fuel cell basically takes hydrogen and turns it into electricity. Um, it gives you uh, the zero uh, uh, burn uh, that, that we're looking for. We, all it does is create water and electricity. And that, that's kind of like what we're probably gonna be looking at. So that particular, um, um, technology is the reason I'm, the other reason I'm, first I was here to see you at Imogene, I, uh, that was it. But uh, the second reason was uh, I'm going to see ABL and they have developed some new uh, fuel cell technology and uh, everybody here in Vancouver knows Ballard, I'm sure, and Ballard does huge uh, products that, that use the, the same technology. I think that this is the technology that will be the enabler. For a small craft like that, no problem. Um, actually, uh, I just went and seen another called Joby. Joby is a vertical takeoff machine. They have a wing and you know what, it, it works really well. I think that they're going to kill the market. They've got a long, a huge contract with Delta um, that they're going to be using their crafts on. And I also think that there's another one out there called ASX, and that's for a government type of a product. That'll carry 20 people, and you swap, like the, the pod has a battery inside of it. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna, when I get back to Detroit, I'm gonna be talking to them a little bit more about moving from just uh, a battery to making it in a hybrid, uh, and the hybrid would be a, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, a fuel cell, that would be um, uh, with hydrogen bottles, uh, which would feed the battery. And by the way, takeoff and landings on vertical machines, uh, you're looking at five and a half C, or, well, you, you have to have a whole lot of power in order to make that happen. So a winged product, as we just mentioned, that, that's definitely the, the easiest, best, fastest way to get into, uh, into, the, uh, into the air. It obviously, who here has seen The Incredibles? It feels, this is exciting because it feels like these, these cartoons that we see are becoming reality and I think that is the, just the coolest thing about the time in which we live. Um, okay, so slightly different approach. With the eBeaver that you have been working on, Erica, it is a retrofit. And one of the challenges there is that, you know, these, these aircraft were designed to have fuel in the wings. You don't have that benefit with putting batteries in the wind necessarily, in the wind, in the wings necessarily. So there's been lots and lots of kind of Tetris issues, but also technical ones as well. Just walk us through the project that you've been working on and uh, where you currently are. Uh, okay, well we, the beaver actually has fuel in the belly. And so we took the fuel out of the belly. We took the uh, 450 horsepower engine off the front, replaced it with the Magniax. Um, it's a 500 kilowatt engine, derated to 336, because we didn't want to increase the power availability. Uh, and we replaced uh, the fuel with uh, lithium ion battery pack. Uh, about, it's 100, we just changed it out. It's 156 kilowatt hour now. 
And it is very much Tetris. We have batteries on the firewall, we have batteries in the fuel bay, and we have batteries inside the, uh, where the passengers would be. Our biggest issue really was that the engine was very inefficiently built, this, this first generation prototype. So we couldn't put any batteries up front, which meant we couldn't put any batteries in the back to maintain weight and balance. So all the batteries had to go in the middle. So this is purely our demonstrator aircraft for demonstrating the technology, for trying out different components, to determine what architecture we want to go to. Do you want a bust battery system? Do we want a non-bust battery system? How do you integrate DC to DC converters that are traditionally quite noisy? Um, quite a bit. We get to test out that, all, the, all that equipment on our current aircraft. The biggest thing actually with the Tetris issue though is really it's about the temperature differentials we're seeing in the batteries. Right? They're, all the batteries aren't in one pack, so they don't all rise and decrease in temperature at the same rate. So that's one uh, interesting effect of doing a retrofit, is trying to figure out how you manage those temperature differentials, and for us that's really going to be all about our ground conditioning system. Um, so I think over and above the charging issues we're going to have, it's going to be about bringing the aircraft into the dock, plugging into the charger, and plugging into a ground conditioning system to ensure that we can dispatch the aircraft at the appropriate temperature and that all the batteries are within X amount of uh, uh, temperature to each other. And I also understand that beyond just the technical challenges that exist, because it is a retrofit, the approval process has been really complicated, and that's not a problem that's unique to your experience, but but just generally. Why does it take so long? <laughs> the real issue is that the regulations don't exist for this technology. And until they actually brought in the latest rules, um, nobody will know what it means, but they brought in uh, performance-based rules, which is allowing industry to help develop the standards we need to meet. So that, that actually has been really beneficial, but in Canada, Transport Canada didn't even uh, adopt that um, performance-based rules until 2021. So we couldn't even apply for our project to move into an SDC or certification until after that was uh, approved. And from there, the standards haven't been built. All the different companies, a lot of the ones that you mentioned, they haven't come to agreement on what is the bar and what do we have to cross? What do we have to do with batteries? What do we have to do with thermal runaway? Do we have to contain it? Can we mitigate and manage um, and prevent cell to cell propagation or do we have to just do containment? Is it a combination of both? How do we test it? What does that test look like? Uh, we have to get to agreement on that, but not only do we have to get agreement on that within industry, we have to get agreement with the regulator, and it's not just one regulator. They don't want different rules for Canada, then the United States, then Europe, and uh, Brazil. All four of those major civil aviation authorities are actually meeting constantly to talk about it, but none of them are on the same plan. <laughs> So there's so many different things, just, and that's just to get the regulations and standards set, and then we have to show that we meet them. So that's part of why it's taking so long. It feels like one of those things where people are like, hey, I've got a really good idea, let's do this thing. And then you kind of kick it a little bit, and you're like, oh, oh this is going to be quite tricky, and we need quite a few people at the table here. Um, so Kim, in terms of BC Hydro's role within electrifying aviation, what on earth are you doing? How do you fit into the puzzle? Well, it's one of those things where, oh, we're going to decide to do this. We've got incredible innovation in our backyard. And then it's that realization of, okay, wait a second. We've got an infrastructure situation and we have to charge it. And what does that look like? And what do the protocols look like? And so where um, we've stepped in is with some of that study funding and incentive funding uh, for demonstration projects to prove things out and allow people to get off the ground and, and um, actually make this take the baby steps to make this happen. So uh, I think from our perspective, not only are we looking at what's happening now, but we're also considering the future. Like what I'm thinking about is, you know, how do we go on and build a network and are there gonna be multiple players that will use that infrastructure within this network? So um, lots of questions and we're still working on the answers to that. As we've been going through this part of the discussion, I've written myself loads of little scrolls. I'm like, okay. There are so many different avenues that we could go down. There are so many different aspects of this conversation. But before we get into them, Mike, I wonder if you could just describe what it feels like to fly that and how it differs from its gas counterpart. Sure. Um, I think the one word maybe that would, would summarize it really is rewarding. Like it's, it's quite a unique and special experience. And we, um, we get a fair amount of licensed pilots who are like, wow, I really want to go and try this kind of novel thing. And yeah, I can just say that I'm, I'm you know, blessed, I think, to, to get to be a part of it. Um, it flies, honestly, just like any other kind of airplane. It goes up, down, left, right, the same way. Oh, thank you. Uh, 
exactly the way any other airplane would. However, it's the underlying component to the system's uh, operation that, that really differs, and that's a really important part in, uh, in aviation is, um, you know, unlike a, a car or an EV where you can just pull over at the side of the road, the pilot has to be able to diagnose what's going on with all of the systems. And so understanding how everything works together, where the critical parts are, and what is, um, you know, substantially different compared to a traditional aircraft, um, which I think is kind of the, the biggest difference. I've been really lucky enough to go in one of these. We filmed an episode, and obviously you're trying to, to be very professional, to be presenting, and then suddenly it feels like you're on this garden chair because it's such a tiny aircraft, and suddenly you're flying and trying to say very sensible things, and it is yeah. quite an extraordinary experience. But I'm right in thinking, it's, it's like 38 kilowatt hour battery. It's pretty, you know, it's a small... About 25 kilowatt hour. Type. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. How did you get into this in the first place? What made you go think, well, all right, we're going to go for an electric aircraft here? Uh, personally, it was it was the flight school that reached out to me. I've done work with them over the past uh, five years or so, and they when they started um, this initiative, they asked me to come and, and be their spokesperson and, and help develop it, which, uh, yeah, really, really, really fortunate to be a part of. And it's really our visionary, uh, Nancy Marshall, who you can, you can meet back there. I wonder... She looks like she's deep in a conversation. So she, it was her idea, really. Um, back in 2019, um, she started seeing the development of electrical or electric aviation in Europe, where these are manufactured, um, and started um, growing, growing that interest in collaborating with Transport Canada on it. And it, uh, um, we're we're lucky to be a part of a Transport Canada trial program, really, where we're working with the. Uh, the regulators, as Erica was, was talking about, to figure out where are these hurdles and what are the standards. Um, and so we are the only flight school in, in Canada that's been granted approval to operate this electric aircraft commercially. Um, it's the first one in the, um, in the country. Uh, and it uh, is a trial program to evaluate where and how these aircraft are going to come into commercial aviation. So there's a few different themes that we've begun talking about. We've spoken about the various battery technologies, the requirement for energy density, perhaps some other solutions that may exist in the space, including hydrogen fuel cells. We have got some challenge, challenges definitely around approvals, infrastructure, and what the process for both of those looks like. But we've also started to talk a little bit about right sizing as well. Where do EV tolls come into the mix or smaller aircraft? But it makes me think that we haven't addressed sustainable aviation fuels. And I wonder if, Michael, you could just paint the scene for us. Where do you see these fitting into the mix, number one? And number two, are they actually sustainable? Uh, so let's start. I, I, I do this advisedly. I'm going to disagree with Sandy Monroe. Oh, this uh, is fun. About two things. A hydrogen has no place in airplanes. Uh, the characteristics of it from a safety perspective and from an energy perspective are impossible to make safe enough for aviation. And so the uh, regulators love it because for 20 years they've been doing boring stuff. Hydrogen failure conditions are extraordinarily exciting for them to engage with. So they're really happy about coming to the job and figuring out what gets going to go wrong and then getting people to test it. Uh, it's just not a solution that's going to make sense. It's also going to be much more expensive than sustainable aviation biofuels. Uh, that's just the nature of the beast for the energy source, and the industry is going to go with the cheapest stuff that achieves the greatest bang for the buck. Uh, and so to the sustainable aviation biofuels perspective, oh, oh, by the way, synthetic aviation fuels made from green hydrogen and stuff are going to be much more expensive than hydrogen. So they're going to be even worse in terms of that. So it's going to be biomass. Uh, I've done the studies globally on biomass sources, uh, just to take one, we throw away 2.5 billion tons of food every year. That's a full third of all the calories we manufacture. And there are many choke points from uh, along the path of delivering it to our homes and in cities for collection of that, and then turning that into biofuels of various types. There's 10 pathways, technical and other things, to biofuels almost dominantly based on waste from our economy today. So this is actually a strong advantage. When we take biomass waste, we eliminate methane emissions from biomass, and we actually get virtuous, sustainable aviation fuels. Um, so no matter what other people are saying about hydrogen, it's a distraction. The cost and technical problems and safety problems are prohibitive. 
Uh, and the second thing I'm going to disagree with Sandy about, but good on you for getting their money, which is the current crop of electric vertical takeoff and landing devices are Jetson's fantasies, they're origami nonsense. None of them have any intellectual capital worth meriting. We're going to have simple rotorcraft in the late 2030s that'll be fit for purpose, but they won't bend, fold, or other stuff. And there is no growth market for EVTOLs. The global rotorcraft market is dropping because the US, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles are taking it out from the underneath. We have heavy lift drones doing crop seeding, crop planting, uh, crop spraying, um, and we have massive amounts of inspection drones are, that are doing uh, running on electricity that are doing what rotorcraft used to do. You know, the entire market for rotorcraft is diminishing. Uh, there's no growth market for these Jetsons fantasies. So uh, much as I appreciate you getting money off them, because you deserve to get money, Sandy, uh, it's not going to lead to good results in terms of climate action. So sustainable aviation fuels, biomass, pathways mostly from waste, very strong, very sustainable, full life cycle, they're the answer. Okay. To, um, Talk about your second point there. Where do you draw? I'm just curious. Where would you draw the line? You know, you're talking about how drones are taking uh, business away from the from the rotor lift. Where do you draw the line then between what's a drone and what's an EV tool? It's Great almost, question. It's the same same kind of concept, but bigger bigger scale, is not. Well, the illusion of the EV tool market is that people are going to get in them and fly. Um, there is a very tiny market. I've spoken to the people who now own the local helijet service the CEO and CFO of Blade Aerospace, um, and they're just running a small number of helicopters. In Canada, in North America, there's only two scheduled helicopter services. That's it. I, I lived in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where they had more private helicopters than any other major city in the world. There are only 750 of them. These okay. are small numbers. Mike, I'm going to interrupt you because we need to make this, we need to have a little bit more of a discussion. I could see some heads shaking over there. I know that some people in this audience agree with you, disagree with you. I know some will agree with you. I know Sandy definitely doesn't agree with you. Do you have any response? Um, Toyota, Honda, Ford Motor Company, um, um, Airbus, Boeing, um, they would disagree with you. I'm not going to disagree with you, I'll let them do it for you, but I'm telling you right now, the Department of Defense <laughs> is uh, one of our customers and uh, they would disagree with you. By the way, we also have, uh, he's coming tomorrow, um, the guy on fuel cells, um, he's, um, uh, he's going for a second PhD, he's wicked smart, his name is Nick. Everybody knows that we can only talk to them for about five minutes and then it's over our head. Anyway, that's the reason we're going to see AVL and, uh, and uh, our friends down at Ballard. Um, you can say what you want. I, 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 I'm not going to, I don't argue, um, but I, I do uh, deliver the goods. They pay me a lot and I deliver the goods. Yeah, I, I just say this having done uh, aeronautics mass balances for uh, aviation airplanes, worked with aerospace engineers around the world, and looking at Ballard's total loss of $1.3 billion since 2020 with zero profits. The hydrogen for energy space is a way for the government to give money to the people they want to give money to. It's not a solution for climate change. It's a climate problem on the scale of all of aviation today. Job one is to fix the climate problem of hydrogen, not to try and shoehorn it where it's not actually particularly useful. Ooh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna park this for a moment, we'll move on. <laughs> um, Paul, I'm gonna come to questions in about, the, after this next question, so if you wanna sit down for two minutes, I will not forget that you have a question. Um, Kim, Mike, Erica, you are operating in and around Vancouver and in, and in British Columbia. If I could grant you some wishes, the things that you could be like, do you know what, if we could just do, insert your thing, and it would make your life so much easier to deploy in your operations, what would you, what would you ask for? Charging. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking the same thing. It was, um, we actually didn't really communicate out very early that we were going to bring the eBeaver to the event because we weren't sure we were going to be able to because of charging. 
Um, we can't charge uh, at the dock here right now. Uh, it, it's a real problem. Finding uh, 480 volt, 100 amp service to bring the aircraft up to where we need it because we recently, uh, when we changed over our battery system, it went to an 800 volt system, 801 for my engineers. Um, <laughs> And the problem is most chargers that run on 220 volts single phase will tap out at 750 volts, which is about 72% state of charge for us. And we can't fly very far on 72% state of charge. And our big charger back at the hangar decided to pack in three of the five power modules and then it was being uh, misbehaving most of the time. Charging is a problem. Everywhere we take it, we can't get charging. Salt Spring, I don't think, has anything that's 480 volts, 100 amp service on the entire island, really, that's available anywhere for us to use. They don't even have a level three charger, so charging. One component to that as well, um, for especially for us, you know, we operate out of Campbell River and we're not able to go very far. We want to be able to start um, growing a network of, of airports that we're able to go to. Um, and looking forwards, one of the um, aspects of charging infrastructure is going to be standardization as well, too. So what is the power delivery? What is the, um, you know, the, the outlet even that's being used in, in the aircraft? Because I'm sure it's different for the e-beaver versus what we have. Versus yeah, what, Pipistrol has um, a proprietary charger. Exactly. There's CCS1 in North America, CCS2 in Europe, NACS if you're a Tesla fan. Uh, there isn't a standardization for even charging ports. Some of the chargers won't work with certain vehicles. It's, it's a real problem. So Kim, <laughs> no pressure. That's all on you. <laughs> Fix it, Kim. <laughs> in time, in time. Uh, no, uh, I, I think for us, engage early, engage often. It's sort of the message that we've been talking about. We definitely want to be at the forefront of helping solve some of these problems. Um, it is in many and, respects. And they are. We, yeah, 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 we are. And we're collaborating. But I think, you know, there's, I think through the demonstration of actually deploying and kudos to um, this group sitting up here because they're doing we learn a lot about what we mistakes or what we would change and hopefully we will fill in the gap for that infrastructure and be able to get to the next level so I guess for me it's probably uh, time <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Paolo Hi, how's it going? Uh, I'm Pablo from Wallbox. Pablo, I'm sorry, I've just been calling you the wrong name. Oh, all good. Pablo. Uh, but yeah, so Wallbox, we manufacture EV charging infrastructure and uh, energy management uh, products. And so my question is, is the concern more about the quality and the uptime of the charging infrastructure or it just not being available? And uh, second tier to that is, should it be the uh, responsibility of the cities and municipalities to incentivize this infrastructure, or is it more about which products you choose and which one has a higher quality uptime? I would I would say all of it, truthfully. Uh, part of it is, okay, well, what, what capacity do we want to have to be able to charge um, electric aircraft? How, how big is it going to get? You know, there's plans for Air Canada to have these um, uh, regional regional jets, I think that's part of what Michael was talking about, um, that are electric and are going to have to charge. And so if we're going to put um, uh, infrastructure, time and money and resources to creating infrastructure, how large, um, and then what is the, the standard uh, going to be for um, utility, as well as just power supply, like a lot of these airports, um, at least that we want to operate in, out of three-phase power is nowhere to be seen. Some of it's quite close, and that's, that's where we work with BC Hydro and uh, have their support is investigating that. Um, um, to your question about who's responsible, I think it's it's larger than just the cities. Uh, when you're looking around, you've got companies like High Sea who's created an electric tugboat. You've got BC Ferries who's looking into electrification. You've got bus systems. Coast Mountain Bus is making an electric bus. TransLink is making electric buses. You're going to need shore power that's capable of supporting a variety of industries. So we need to be working together probably at the provincial, possibly the federal level, definitely the city levels, and the industry need to be sitting there at the table so that we are not all sitting there holding different hoses, looking at the plug going, huh, cool. Maybe it'll fit yours. <laughs> uh, let me just take two seconds to say, and it's not a problem. We've been drawing massive cables to electrify major requirements for over a century. Kim and the Hydro people are astounding operational people managing a system which is essential for our life, but that hasn't changed much. Now they're being asked to become transformational people. So when you talk to Kim afterwards, tell her you feel your pain, they're her pain, because they're having to change a lot, but it's not 
difficult. There's no technical problems or economic problems with this. It's just doing the work. Very quick question. Um, from a missions point of view, uh, the numbers are pretty upsetting. Like a return flight from New York to London and back, um, two of those in a year is like more than 100% of the carbon per capita emission to stay at 1.5 degrees warming. Um, any response that is kind of equal to what we're facing will eventually probably have to incorporate some type of rationing of flight. Um, is that on your guys' kind of risk radar in the future? And uh, what can what can be done to kind of put the toothpaste back in the tube to regard flying as more of a a luxury once in a while thing as opposed to you know Airbus like you you get on the bus like you do every day. Um, how can we change this industry to be commensurate with what we're dealing with? That is a really great question and also something I wanted to, to mention. I saw in the news yesterday that actually there's a big probe into frequent flyer programs offered by credit cards. And I think that's really interesting and, and something that I know we haven't covered in this panel yet is that behavioral component and how we kind of, you know, yeah, exactly as, as you've described. We are at time, so if there are any quick thoughts. Uh, yeah, the quick thought is it's a North American problem. Uh, in North America, we fly vastly more than people in, uh, four times more than the average for Europe, and vastly more than, we, than people in China. In the rest of the world, they're starting to build high-speed electrified rail. China has 45,000 kilometers. They have vastly more people, passenger kilometers, on rail than they do in aviation. Um, we have more high-speed rail in Morocco and Indonesia than we do in North America. So don't think that the North American problem is a global problem. But we have the opportunity right now, like aviation has a hard time recently even bringing young people into it, bringing new talent into it. And the exciting opportunity we have today, yes, we're working on an aircraft that fits six people. It's not going from New York to Europe, right? But the technology can be upscaled. At some point, it will be used in the larger aircraft, right? You have to figure out how to certify the engine, how to certify the battery. Then you can use it in hybrid applications, possibly in hydrogen applications. <laughs> but we have the opportunity, and so that's the exciting thing, and that's the call that we make is, hey, you want to help us change it? Then join us and help us change it. I, uh, yeah, I'd like to even add on what, what Erica said too in, in relation to um, kind of how EVs have developed and if you look around with you know everything that's come out of the EV mo movement, I think if you think back 10, even 12 years ago, the capability, like that, that's when EVs started hitting the road. I think the, you know, even Nissan had a, had a model of the Leaf out back in um, 2012, but they weren't, they weren't used very much. I mean, I think they went 50 kilometers or something like that. And that's, that's kind of where maybe we are in aviation at the moment, is we're back at that, you know, gen one of, of EVs, um, where the capability will grow into what we see uh, now today with, uh, with, the, with the progress that has been made there. Sandy. Okay, so I actually uh, am working on things that will get us across the Atlantic Ocean right now. And I can tell you for sure, just like I said in 2018, that by 2030, we would have 50% of all automotive made either hybrid or electric. And I was right then and booed then. I'm telling you right now, 10 years after that, 2040, we will have aircraft that will get across the Atlantic Ocean and they will not be using jet fuel, JP-8, or whatever derivative you want, because the world doesn't need it any longer, period. You had it here first. Well, this has been really fun and I know that we've generated more questions than we have provided answers so I hope we continue to have this discussion at the side of stage. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to our wonderful panelists. <laughs>